<clears throat> okay. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Torres online seminar talk of three D geometry and weighing. Uh, it's our great honor to invite uh, Dr. Rui Zhen, who from Shenzhen University. Uh, Rui Zhen's research interests are in computer graphics. Uh, with a recent focus on applying machine learning to advance the understanding and the modeling of visual data. Today, she will introduce some research progress of her group, and the talk title is Learning Based Shape Completion and Manipulation. Okay, let's welcome. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Rui Zhen Hu from Shenzhen University. on learning based shape completion and manipulation. As we all know, there is a trend to apply learning based methods on geometric data like meshes, point clouds, structures, and uh, structural representations like graph, trees, and so on. And when coming to uh, specific tasks, so, some of them can easily find and construct data to supervise the learning. Well, some others can only have a measure to describe what you want, and thus reinforcement learning method is used. So how to choose an appropriate learning model better fits the problem setting becomes quite important. So in today's talk, I will introduce two works on shape conditions that are solved via uh, supervised learning, and three works on shape manipulations that are solved via reinforcement learning to give some study cases and discuss why different learning-based methods are chosen. So first, uh, let's check the works on shape completion. Those two works can be considered as two variations of traditional shape completion with actual input or constraints. For example, instead of taking one partial point cloud as input, the first work takes two partial scans of the same object as input and tackles the tally registration and completion task simultaneously. And the second work tries to complete the two close by objects together while keeping their spatial relationship. Now, let me give more details about the first work, starting with those keywords. As we know, shape registration is a long-standing problem with a large variety of methods proposed over the last decades. The goal is to align two partial scans uh, belonging to the same object in different poses. However, in some real situations, the two scans we obtained may be incomplete and thus have little or even no overlap at all. The so registration in this case is quite different from the traditional one, which is usually referred to as uh, tally registration. Well, in this work, we want, we want to not only register the input partial scans, but also generate the missing region to obtain the complete object. So to summarize, uh, taking two partial scans of uh, an um, object as input, especially when the two scans are presented in arbitrary initial poses and having little or even no overlap, overlap regions. Our goal is to register them and at the same time complete the shape. We found that existing methods cannot work well on this setting. Here are two latest registration works based on different methods. Uh, the key of those two methods is to find the feature points, uh, feature point correspondence between a pair of shapes. Let's say have a strong assumption that a certain overlap exists between its, uh, the input shapes. For the tally registration of non-overlapping data, there are, uh, those two works have attempt in 2D and 3D, but they either only applied on 2D images are based on hand graph data features, which cannot be easily extended to our setting. There are also an increasing number of works focusing on shape completion. We can see that most of the work still requires that the input point cloud has certain coverage of the original object. So how to combine the information of two partial scans becomes a key. One way here is to register those two partial scans first. 
and then completes them. However, as mentioned earlier, this tally registration is very difficult when there's no overlap between the input shape. The other way is to first complete those two shapes respectively and then register them. The difficulty of registration become largely in reduced in this case. However, the completion is challenging since each partial scan only cover a small portion of the shape. So uh, the key idea to be consistent. The upright should to first rotate the scan to the uh, canonical view, thus reduce the complexity of the shape generation. And finally, we rotate the completed shape back to the same pose as input. The last function of the completion network is mainly composed of two parts. The first loss function aims to ensure that the rotation parameters are put by uh, the orientation module are correct. And the second loss is used to ensure that the missing region predicted by the generation module is correct. Well, for the uh, registration network, the input is a pair of partial scans with one scan taken as the anchor and the output is the transformation that can be used to register the remaining scan to the anchor. Here we take part two as the anchor. The network first predicts the relative rotation from part one to part two and then further predicts the transformation uh, translation from rotated part one to part two eventually to get the final registration result. So loss function that consists of rotation loss and translation loss. To test our method, we construct our data based on the shape map data, which consists of around 30,000 objects from eight categories. Here we show the result of our CG AFNAT on synthetic data. The input pair of parts are central as uh, at the origin point, as shown in the first two columns. Uh, by taking either part as an anchor, our method, our method is able to register them accurately, as shown in the third and fourth column. Then the fifth and sixth columns show the completed shape of each part and the last two columns as a corresponding ground truth completion, uh, complete shape for comparison. Here as a result on the other four categories, we can see that both the registration and the completion module in our CTFNet can work well for parts given in two different orientations. To demonstrate the generality of our method, we use 3D scanners to manually scan several objects from all those eight categories for testing. Here as a result on the scan data, note that the input partial point uh, parts can still be correctly aligned, even the quick cloud are noisy and non-uniformly distributed. Here as a result on other four categories, we can see that on the first row, although the two parts of the couch are quite noisy and it covers a uh, different region of the couch, our method is to uh, be able to successfully align them and complete the missing region in the front. Uh, to further justify the general generality of our method, we also tested our model on other real scan datasets. Here are the result on the relevant datasets. We see that in the last row, our method successfully predicts the missing leg of the table. And here are some results on Pixel 3D dataset. And we can see in the uh, first row, uh, the entire trip back is successfully reconstructed. Here are some view comparison of the results obtained by different completion methods. Our method achieves the best result comparing to others, and the generated points are evenly distributed in the missing regions. Here we show some video comparison of our method to other registration methods on different uh, overlap data. The input pair or partial scan uh, parts is shown in the first row. And to better illustrate the overlap region, we show the input pair in the second row after rotating uh, each part into a 
canonical view and marks the overlap region with a light color. Next four rows shows the registration result provided by different methods. And we observe that our CTF net performs stably uh, on different overlap data as shown in the red column. Button corner, even there is no overlap between the head and the toe of the plane, our method is still able to align two parts in the correct position with a certain margin of NATO. Here we show some quantitative comparison of the rotation and translation errors of our CTF net on different overlapping data. We can see that both the rotation and the translation errors of almost all the methods keep, uh, keep increasing as the overlapping region decrease, while our method is most stable showing green here. Now for the other variation of shape completion, we take things that are composed of different uh, multiple objects into consideration. Especially with folks on pairwise things, where two objects are in close proximity and are contextually uh, related to each other, such as a chair in front of the desk, fruit in the basket, and the flowers inside the vase. Instead of completing the shape one by one, which may cause object penetration or bloating, our goal is to complete two partial scans together while keeping correct spatial relationships. To achieve the pairwise completion of two objects, A and B, we can complete object A first and then complete object B, or the other way around. We know that different completion orders will lead to different completion results. And the key idea here is to make completion results of different passes to be the same by adding consistency loss as in, as in the previous method. And know that this pairwise completion task not only require uh, the completion of each single object, but also a reasonably spatial, a reasonable spatial relationship between objects. So when completing one partial point cloud, we need to take another partial point cloud as, uh, into consideration, which makes it a conditional completion problem. To solve such a problem, we modify the traditional completion uh, network to be a conditional completion network. In more details, uh, the input of the network is a partial scan, which contains a focal object showing orange that needs to be completed, and the other object showing blue as a condition. As the network first compute pairwise features for each point, and then obtain the global feature by max pooling, to gather information for completion of the focal object, we expand and pad the global features only to the point feature of the focal object to gather new global features specific, specific to the focal object to guide the completion. We use earth mover distance as shape completion loss in each completion step. So here is the two pass network we proposed. Shape loss is defined for completional network uh, completion in each step, and the consistency loss is different for two passes. We change the left pass network and the right pass network respectively, right? And then fine tune, fine -tune those two passes with the uh, consistency loss. Know that the training order of the left pass and the right pass doesn't matter here. Here are some results of our method. We can see that the missing part of each object is completed and the relationship between the two objects are reasonably uh, well, and there is no uh, penetration between two objects for all those close interactions. And the objects that should contact each other are close enough. For objects, with very important part miss missing, such as the tip of the hook in the second row, the overall structure can be well reconstructed according to the clue provided by the other object, such as the head. 
here are some results on the other four categories. Uh, to demonstrate the generality of our method, we also test our trained uh, network on real scan data from the scan net and the data we captured by Kinect. Those two rows show the result from ScanNet. With the label of things, we can easily take out the partial scan of the desk and the chair pair, and further down sample the partial data to prepare the input to our system. The result show here uh, shows that although the desk surface have holes because of the object on top of it, after applying our method, the desk surface are completed and the condition result of the chair are reasonable as well. We also capture things by Kinect. After getting the raw point cloud, uh, we manually segment it into two parts for simplicity. Note that it is not difficult to obtain the segmentation since the two parts are loosely attached or uh, even uh, apart from each other. For the flower and the vase example, the flower stem can be complete, uh, completed and uh, located inside the vase uh, nicely, even when the whole stem is missing in the input partial scan. We also compare our method against uh, several baseline methods. Uh, for the example show in the fifth row, the input contains a curved desk as most of the desks in our dataset are rectangle ones, the baseline methods all complete the desk to the uh, to be rectangle desks, which results in penetrations between the desk edge and the chair bag. Well, our method nicely avoids the penetration because when completing the desk, the location of the uh, chair points are considered. For the objects that form a support relation, the result of baseline methods contain many penetrations of the floating uh, and the floating between two objects, while our method can produce a good contact between them. For more difficult inputs such as block hangers and hooks, our method can also produce better overall shapes. So all those are visual examples. For quantitative evaluation, we first use EMD to measure the similarity between the uh, completed point cloud uh, and the ground truth point cloud. But we found that the EMD value cannot reflect whether the spatial relationship is kept well. For example, the first row here show results with worse relationships, where the hanger for the clothes is too small and the flower stem is outside of the vase. And the example shown in the second row are actually better uh, regarding to the spatial relationship between those two objects. However, the EMD values are sometimes larger for examples in the second row. So it means that the EMD values doesn't uh, reflect the relationship quality well. So we need to introduce a metric that indicates the spatial relationship more precisely. And we define a relationship distance based on the interaction bisector surface between pairs of shape uh, proposed in previous works. Uh, more specifically, it is defined as the L1 distance uh, between relationship features extracted from the IBS, that is uh, interaction by sex surface. And uh, the quantitative results I show here, the table shows that our method has the lowest uh, relationship distance for all types of things, which indicate our completion results recover the spatial relationship better than all baseline methods. Also sacrifice a little bit of uh, the overall EMD comparing to the original telnet method. So to summarize a bit, for the first set of works, there are two variations of shape completion tasks with actual input or constraints. As a key of those two works, 
is to ensure consistency between two passes, either by switching the order or to operators or two shapes. And both of them are solved using uh, supervised learning as it's quite easy to, easy to get pairs of partial and the complete point clouds of the same object to provide the training data. For the second set of works on shape manipulation using uh, reinforcement learning, we will see that uh, the first two works have similar tasks and applications in robotics. While well, those two works have similar formulations that can be solved using similar methods, although they have totally different applications. Now let's first check the uh, first we call grasp and place problem, which requires a robotic arm not only to grasp the objects successfully, but also to place the object stably on the table in its upright orientation. And here we focus more on the problem of upright orientation estimation, which is a typical geometric analysis problem. Our goal here is to design a more versatile uh, neural network, which can estimate the upright direction of the input shape, no matter it is represented by a complete or partial point cloud, or even a single scan. Note that when we prepare the training data for such a network, we usually know the current uh, upright direction of the input shape, show as the orange arrow here. So the most direct option is to consider this problem as a, a regression problem. And we can define the loss based on the difference between the predicted direction and the ground truth upright direction. Then apply uh, adopt a supervised learning method uh, to train the model. But we found that we can consider this problem in a nice way. That is to consider it as an orientation correct correction problem with the target upright direction, which is the uh, Z axis and the show as the blue arrow here. The goal is to predict uh, the rotation matrix that can turn the current orientation uh, upright direction to the target direction. Then for a testing shape, once we have the predicted rotation matrix R, uh, we can rotate the target upright direction back to get the predict uh, predicted direction for the input shape. But one thing to note here is that there are multiple rotation matrices that can turn the input direction to the target direction. So instead of selecting one of them to perform supervised learning, the key idea of our method is to consider it as a sequential decision-making process and solve it using reinforcement learning method where we train an agent to rotate the input shape step by step until it's upright oriented. So in this way, the initial and the updated state of the input object can be considered as the observation and the action is sampled from a set of predefined rotations. In more details, if we assume that the positive direction of the z-axis, uh, showing blue here, is the desired upright direction, then we can add four rotations into the action space, including rotation around the x-axis counterclockwise or clockwise, and the rotation around the y-axis uh, counterclockwise and clockwise. Then we also define an extra uh, stop action that allows the agent to terminate the iteration by itself. With this action space, we can design a network to select a sequence of action to perform upright correction for the given shape. Here is the network structure of our model, which is called upright IO. In 
each iteration, we extract a point cloud feature using point net. Then the agent will uh, output the probability of those five actions. And one action is sampled and applied to the input point cloud to get the updated state. The updated point cloud will be the input of the next step. And the iteration will stop if a stop if the stop action is sample, or the maximum number of step is reached. And to guide the training of the network, we need to define a reward function to evaluate the action applied in each step. So we compare the two point clouds before and after applying the sampled action. Here we use the orange arrow to represent the current uprising direction of the point cloud, and the blue arrow to uh, represent the target uprising direction. So into, uh, intuitively, we define a reward function to encourage the orange arrow to get closer to the blue one with smaller number of steps. We consider the upright correction to be successful if the angle between those two directions is smaller than a given threshold as in previous works. Uh, but instead of uh, setting the threshold to be 15 degrees only, we also tested uh, 5 and 10 degrees to evaluate the result in a more accurate manner. Then for a testing set, the success rate is used as the evaluation metric. So uh, to test our method, we build three data sets from the completion 3D benchmark for uh, three different types of inputs. As mentioned uh, earlier, we can solve this problem using supervised learning. So we also define a network called the base net to predict the current orientation direction directly for comparison. And this table shows a comparison between our measure based on uh, reinforcement learning and the base net, uh, which use supervised learning on those three data sets. We can see that our method, uh, our method generally produce more accurate results than base net. The difference is more clear, especially when setting a uh, smaller threshold. For example, uh, the success rate on the five degree uh, upright IL is more than two times two times higher than that of the base net for all three data sets. Here are some view comparison between our mesh, our model and the base net. We can see that even for partial input with large uh, large missing part, our method can still successfully rotate it into its upright orientation. Now with the upright direction obtained by our method, let's get back to the grasp and the place task. Given an object lying on the table, we first take a scan to get the input point cloud. Then we use grasp nets to get a set of candidate grasping poles and our model to get the upright direction. Here we use a gripper skeleton to represent the gripper and the orange arrow to represent the current upright direction. And our goal is to select an optimal pose uh, to grasp and place the object in its upright orientation. So uh, we propose a grasping pose selection method based on the upright direction. The first, that, uh, the first step is projection filter, where we project the input scan and the gripper key points onto the upright direction. If some part of the gripper pro, uh, projection lies outside the scan projection, the gripper, uh, the gripper will collide with the table when placing the object. So we consider this kind of pulse invalid. And this is a valid pulse where, uh, whose projection is fully inside the scan projection. These are all the valid pulses left after the first projection filter step. And the second step is angle selection. 
we think that when grasping pulse is uh, perpendicular to the upright direction, then the con con contact region will be larger and the final placement will be more stable. So we compute the angle between the grasping pulse direction and the upright direction and select the one with angle closest to 90 degrees. With this optimal grasping pulse we selected and the upright direction, now we can control the robot to grasp and place the object. Here are some uh, more demos of grasping and uh, placing different objects. Now for the second work, what we call the transport and the pack task, the final goal is quite clear. That is to find a good packing of the uh, a given set of objects. So we first define a metric to evaluate the final packing quality consisting of uh, compactness, permeability, and stability which I think are quite intuitive and standard for packing problems. But like the upright correction problem, uh, there might be multiple optimal solutions for the same input. That is, the optimal solution is not unique. For example, the input boxes can be packed in different ways into the target container, but with the same final packing effect as we show here in 2D for clear uh, illustration. So we also solve this problem using reinforcement learning and the key challenge is how to encode the input observation. One thing to note here is in each step we need to pick one object from the input set and then pack it into the target container. As objects are al already in a physical arrangement uh, in the input, the object movement must follow a partial order with axis constraints. Here we use a robotic gripper to help illustrate the axis constraints. As shown in this example, object E can be successfully transported, while object A cannot, since object D blocks its way and needs to be moved first. So to address this problem, we encode the access constraints, constraints into a precedence graph. Uh, in more details, we allow the object to be rotated during the transport and pack process. So uh, in 2D cases, each box will have two different states, the original state and the rotated state. And the precedence graph is used to indicate whether uh, each of those two states is valid given current object or, uh, arrangement. To construct uh, the graph, we extract three types of edges to encode the precedence relationship between uh, due to the blocking from the top or the sides, including uh, TB, LAB, and RAB edges. TB edge indicates top blocking. For example, box E blocks the top of D. So there is a TB edge pointing from E to D. LAB edge or RAB edge means the access to the left and the right side of the box is blocked for rotation. For example, box E blocks the access to the left side of D and C blocks the right. Here is the complete uh, comp uh, precedence graph for the input set given on the left. To pass the information stored in the precedence graph to our network for packing optimization, we need to find a good way to encode all those nodes and edges. For each box, the orange, original and the rotated states are encoded respectively. We encode each state using its size and encode the precedence information uh, using binary codes. For example, box A is pointed by two TV address from E and D. So 
both states of A, the corresponding uh, position in TB encoding are set as one. For the original states, uh, LAB, RAB are all set as zero since it's only used for the rotated states. Then for the rotated states, the corresponding position in LAB, RAB encoding with access constraints are set as one. Therefore, the only condition for packing any state of any of box is that its precedence encoding are all zero, like the box B here in this case. Note that the geometry information of the shape is static during the whole process. So, uh, but the precedence information is dynamic while uh, which will be updated when an object is selected and removed. For example, when E is re uh, transported and packed, address related will be removed and the corresponding code will be updated. <clears throat> now we have the information encoded in the precedence graph and with a target container, TabNet starts to find objects for packing. Uh, in details, our tabnet consists of an encoder, a decoder, and an attention module. The encoder encodes both static and dynamic information from the precedence graph, and the decoder is a recurrent neural network. For each time step, it takes objects selected in the previous step and the current height map uh, of the target container as input and pass the accumulated information to the attention module with the encoder to compute the probability of each item valid for transport and packing. And the item with maximal probability is selected to be the output. In this example, box E in its original state is selected. The removal of box E will introduce an update of the precedence graph and the packing E into the target container will lead to the update of the packing height map as well. So all the dynamic information gets updated. And moreover, the item coming from the same object that's box E in the rotation state needs to be set as invalid. With the information back to the tabnet, the next object will be selected, uh, which is the rotated box B in this case. The whole process iterates until all the all boxes are transported and packed into the target container. Note that our tabnet only outputs the packing sequence. And to find the packing position of the selected objects, uh, we employ a simple heuristic-based uh, strategy, which tries the button left corner of each empty um, maximal space and selects the one with the highest packing quality. We actually tried a more sophisticated linear-based packing strategy and found that this simple strategy works best with our tabnet. Our uh, hypothesis is that the heuristic packing placement strategy is more predictable and here, <clears throat> and hence it is easier for tabnet to anticipate where the next box will be placed. And so it can output the optimal box and its orientation accordingly. To test our method, we design two datasets. The first data one is called a render dataset. The initial box configuration were generated randomly. The second one is called the perfect packing solution guaranteed set, uh, short as PPSG set. To generate the initial configuration, we first generate a perfect packing target container we, we call it as candidate perfect packing solution, CPPS. Then we can take the box out of the target container 
in a sequence to form an initial configuration, which guarantees to be reversible for packing back into the CPVS, which means for the, this set, we know that the perfect packing result exists. Here we show some tap results in 2D on random data and the PPSD data. We can see that TapNet is able to find a perfect packing solution other than CPPS that are used to generate the input testing data. Note that our method can easily be extended to 3D. Here the whole process is the same and we just have six different states for uh, 3D objects instead of 2 in 2D. And uh, well, for the packing colors measure in 3D cases, an object is considered as stable if the projection of its center is inside the region formed by the supporting points. Here are some results on 3D cases. And each case is shown with the front view and back, of, back view of the computer. <clears throat> now I will give one more example in data visualization, which may seem irrelevant at first, uh, but eventually it's also about shape manipulation in a sense. And it can also be solved using reinforcement learning. Uh, star glyphs are a type of radio plot that show data points in a compact representation with a coordinate axis circularly arranged around a central point. And the order of the coordinate axis heavily influences the shape and thus its perception during the analysis tasks. So the desired shape of a star glyph depends on the visualization task. Most of existing works study the coordinate ordering problem for a single star glyph with the goal to improve properties like uh, symmetry or saliency. But for similarity search and grouping among a set of graph, uh, star glyphs, especially when associated, uh, associated to multiple class labels, the uh, perceptual difference between glyphs become more important. So in this work, our goal is to maximize UU class separation by optimizing the coordinate ordering of the glyphs. That is to minimize the uh, interclass shapes distances and maximize the interclass distances. So essentially it can be considered as a reshaping problem by reordering the coordinates. And to solve this problem, we propose a reinforcement learning based method for coordinate reordering. Uh, the network structure is very similar to the one we used in the TAP, uh, TAP yeah, transport and the TAP problem, TAP problem. Since both problems aim to find a good sequential order for a given set, and the key here becomes to define a, a proper reward function to guide the training of this ordering network. As I mentioned, the goal is to maximize video class separation. So we defined a shape-driven class separation measure as a reward function. <coughs> And the first keyword is shape-driven, which means that we want to define a perceptual distance measure between two stack leaves based on their shapes. And a natural choice is the classical shape context descriptors. And uh, in more details, giving a stack leaf represented by a 2D polygons, we first sample a set of points on, and then for each sample of points, we create a grid and compute the relative position of the other points by counting the number of points for falling in each bin of the grid. Then the counting creates a spatial histogram, which is the shape context descriptor of the central point, and it can be stored as a two-dimensional 
uh, matrix. To measure the distance between two shape contacts, uh, shape contacts descriptors of two points, we employ a chi square test between those two uh, matrices. And for two star glyphs, their perceptual distance is defined as the average distance of all pairs of shape contacts descriptors of the corresponding points. Note that the sampled points are naturally in correspondence along the boundary. With the shape distance of each pair of star glyphs, we measure the class separation of the entire set by serial as coefficients. Uh, which is also a very common measurement uh, in classroom problem, which refers to uh, measure how similar a shape is to its own cluster comparing to other clusters, and then takes the maximum value of, over all the cluster means. <clears throat> and high as a coefficient indicate better uh, class separation. And so we use it as the reward function for the, uh, to guide the training of the ordering network. We also contact, uh, conduct a user study to justify our class separation measure. In this study, uh, users are shown with a set of star glyphs without labeling. Then they are asked to manually group the glyphs into clusters. Note that the size of each cluster can be different, and the number of cluster is all uh, is also decided by the user. So the average grouping quality of the result will indicate the perceptual class separation of the star glue sets. And for the study, we randomly synthesize ten data sets with various dimensions, class numbers, and sizes. Uh, for each set, set we find the. Uh, <clears throat> Coordinate ordering with low SC and high SC, respectively. Here, SC is short for silver uh, as coefficient and the shape of where class separation measure we use. In addition, we also add one more ordering following another strategy to present the cylinder shapes with spike spikes for comparison. Here are the results from 20 users for the three orderings. The grouping quality is measured by comparing the user, uh, user groupings and the ground truth groupings. We can see that the ordering with high SC help users achieve higher grouping quality, which means that the class separation measure we propose is useful and stable. Here are some visual uh, results. We can see that the glyphs with optimized uh, coordinate order shown in the second row have better contrast between classes. The purpose method can actually be generalized to other type of plot, plots like uh, Rilavis plots, which arrange each dimension around a circle and plot high dimensional points into the circle inside the circle. And the different coordinate order can also lead to different perceptual for relevance. So just like for star glyphs, we also want to optimize the coordinate order of the relevance for better uh, separation between classes. Uh, so we can reuse our network with, but with reward function replaced by the class separation measure commonly used for relevance. Here are some view examples. We can see that the clusters are distributed further away in the optimized uh, order, uh, coordinate order uh, shown in the second row. So kind of to conclude today's talk, I introduced two variations of shape completion tasks with the actual input or uh, constraints. And the key of both works is to ensure consistency of results generated from two passes. Both of those problems are solved using supervised learning. Then I introduced three shape manipulation tasks with two shared applications <clears throat> in robotics. 
and to share similar uh, output with sequential order for a uh, given input set. All those three problems are solved using reinforcement learning as they all have very clear goal, but multiple optimal solutions for the input, uh, for the same input. And I believe that the key is to formulate the problem in the right way. That is the way to encode the observation, uh, to construct the action space, and to de uh, design the reward function. So this ends my talk. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, uh, many thanks for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, so we go to the next uh, stage. Uh, uh, in the next, uh, we go to the uh, question and an answer session. Uh, in this section, we are also very happy to in, uh, invite Chi uh, Xin Huang from uh, UT Austin and uh, Tianjia South from uh, Zhejiang University to join this session. Uh, okay, so the first we uh, we already have some uh, several questions from YouTube. Uh, the first question is that uh, so it's a very general question is so how is the general uh, generalization or ability of the network to uh, answer uh, categories? I think it's for the uh, the first task the shape of completion task. Uh, so, okay, so how is it? Uh -huh. Okay, 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 go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, actually, I think the generality ability uh, of the completion network to unseen category is not, not good because I think like all those uh, previous completion network, uh, like uh, the network learns, uh, actually learns to remember some features of the given categories. If we never seen shapes from that category, we may uh, complete the local geometry based on what we already seen in the data set. So I think, uh, uh, I think uh, to make the completion network to be able to uh, generalize well to unseen category, um, the net, uh, the, it need more information, I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, the second question is that uh, uh, currently, uh, almost in these two years, uh, the linear uh, implicit representation of geometry is very effective uh, in many tasks like uh, uh, reconstruction and uh, rendering. So can you talk about uh, the linear representation in uh, shape completion and the point called registration? Um, what, so what do I, you mean? Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the linear implicit uh, uh, representation. Implicit yeah, representation? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so in for the, uh, uh, for the completion and uh, registration task, we actually take point cloud as input. Uh, so this is the representation we use. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, um, what, what what's the question? So can we use an another type of uh, representation? Yeah, I think this question is that uh, if uh, the the uh, the shape the shape form uh, formulation of the input shape is not point cloud, it's uh, uh -huh. it's uh, yeah it's uh, replaced by this uh, implicit uh, representation. Uh, is it okay. possible to uh, yeah to get um, uh, better performance or something like this? Oh yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, the clarif uh, clarification. Uh, yes, I think so because currently the input and output we uh we take both input and uh, uh, represent both input and output using point clouds. And so uh, for the output, it uh, may not have man, uh, the many geometric details, but if we uh, turn it into an uh, implicit representation, so which means we, uh, we uh, somehow learn uh, 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 implicit view for the generated shape, 
uh, then eventually uh, we uh, generate a, uh, generate the uh, shape, generate the uh, final mesh using matching cube or something like that. Then I think we may have more uh, uh, have uh, have output with higher quality. Yeah, when we didn't try this, but I think it works uh, to to uh, to explore this direction. Yeah. Okay, uh, the last question is about the uh, circle manipulation. So in the uh, circle man manipulation uh, work, where the model undergoes a, a rigid transformation, uh, can the learning-based circle manipulation handle non-rigid transformation? Uh, non-rigid transformation, like, like, like deformation of a hand? Or what kind of non-rigid transformation? Mm, based on my, uh, my understanding that uh, uh, currently simple manipulation is just or just the uh, uh, just uh, uh, or just the uh, they just the uh, just undergo rigid transformation. But if mm -hmm. if we just uh, grasp the object to to the 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 simple undergoes non-rigid, for example. Uh, we we have we uh we grasp this uh, this uh, this shape, but uh, this this shape is uh, can be uh, can be uh, can undergo long uh transformation in this way. Yeah, maybe uh, I can uh, you can uh, I mean that uh. The shape is only uh, currently you you show in this example is just also only notation and translation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, I, 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 from my understanding, uh, these words can just ask uh, if the shape, the I mean the robotic robotic grasp of this shape and the shape is uh, have have some deformation, I think. Uh, yeah. I th uh, so I know there is a group of works on uh, in robotics. They will do like uh, object manipulation, like uh, uh, for example, um, uh, close uh, close the laptop or something like that. So this is uh, uh, this isn't a rigid transformation. Uh, kind of they interact with ob objects. And there are some part-wise uh, manipulation here. So uh, I think it's possible to use reinforcement learning to learn such kind of interactions as to uh, optimize the whole uh, like moving sequence. Uh, yeah, I think it's possible. And I think there's a, a bunch of works in robotics. They have studied this. But the work I introduced today focused more on the geometric aspect of the uh, task. Like we, I, I didn't plan for the uh, movement or configuration change of the robotic arms, but instead to estimate the geometric property of the given shape to help with the uh, task that, that should be completed by the robot arm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Qixi and uh, Tianjia, do you have uh, any questions for the uh, reasons talk? Uh, Tianjia, do you want to go first? Oh uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a uh, a minor question. So uh, I observed that uh, your uh in the in your shape completion work, uh, some uh the some detailed shape of the completed results are not so so good so and i also observed that uh most recent uh deep learning based methods have difficulties to deal with such uh, detailed shape completion uh do you have some comments about this uh this uh, issue uh yeah uh, thank you for the question yes so uh i think it, it, this is related to the previous uh question about the uh, neural representation of the uh, uh of the input and output since currently our output is uh uh is point cloud with 
a fixed number of points. So uh, it cannot really represent the geometry detail well. And the focus of our method is like for the second work is focus on uh, uh, keeping uh, the uh, spatial relationship between two objects instead of focusing on the detailed uh, geometry of each object. So to improve the uh, geometry details of the generated shape, uh, as I answered in the previous method, uh, question, I think maybe using uh, uh, implicit representation will be better since there you can make uh, sample more points uh, uh, in a, uh, in a uh, higher resolution grade to get uh, a more compact representation of the final output to uh, to be able to have more geometric details. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think I, I also have a question regarding the completion, right? So I think the many geometric shapes they have uh, structures like symmetries uh like uh primitive structures um so usually for example like before the deep learning era right what people do uh was to detect those structures right symmetries and structures using those kind of symmetries to do the completion right so this applies to uh many man-made shapes um for for point cloud, do you think uh, those those kind of structure information, right? This uh, is automatically captured by the completion network to some extent. Uh, thank you uh, for the question. I think it's it's also a very good question. Uh, actually, I don't think so because currently, if we use point cloud as output representation. So the loss we used is uh, EMD loss. Uh, some mm -hmm. works use chamfer distance loss. I think those two kind of uh, loss functions, they didn't actually uh, consider those uh, sharp features. So to, uh, to uh, take such uh, sharp features or like primitive uh, features uh, into consideration, I think we need to really uh, try to define a better uh, objective function, a loss, loss function that uh, can can really uh, really uh, have folks on those features. I think it, it depends on the loss function we use. And uh, as currently, I didn't know any work that can uh, can deal with such kind of uh, features we want to preserve. So I think it's also a promising direction worth to explore. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now, thanks. Now it's uh, Tinjo's turn. Okay. Tinjo, do you have a uh, more question for the talk? Currently, I, I don't have. Okay. Okay, if not, okay, uh, so one more question, oh, maybe, okay, maybe okay. regarding the uh the the, the manipulation. Um, mm -hmm. so for for the for the packing one, um, mm -hmm. um so you use a discretization, right? So so essentially the, the space is discretized. Uh, yes. So uh, do you see a computational bottleneck over there in terms of uh, how dense the, the the grid could be? Uh, uh, it's also a very good question. And actually, uh, due to the time limit, I didn't give uh, more details about our experiment. But we have one experiment on this on the uh, resolution of the grid uh, in, in the paper. And uh, we tested uh, our method, so the performance doesn't change much as the res resolution goes. The key, uh, the key is because uh, our uh, the input and output and also the network 
uh, it doesn't depend on the resolution of the uh, of the rate. Uh, let's take this. Uh, maybe this. Like for the encoding of the input uh, of our method, we only uh, use uh, a size. Size is only a uh, geometric information we encode. So if the uh, we have higher re re uh, have grade with higher resolution, we will just have more uh, larger size. Uh, then the network. Uh, output will not change. Input output will not change, but uh, but if we increase the resolution of the container, one step does uh this packing. This packing because we use uh heuristic based uh, packing, so this one uh the time will increase a little bit, but it doesn't hurt much to uh the uh, the overall performance of our method, yeah. Okay, maybe a relevant question, like uh, think about mm -hmm. the big picture, right? The pa packing, certainly you introduced uh, a new method, okay? But packing has many other methods, right? So this kind of uh, hill climbing, this kind of simulated uh, nearly uh, those old traditional methods. Um, yeah. Do you, think, do you think there's a chance that you can come Combine the strengths of uh, your method and those old ones. Yes, like that's also a good. Some, very, some yeah. of them into in, into your pipeline, for example, right? So. Uh, yes, this is also a very good question. You combine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, we tried several different packing strategies proposed in previous method. And the TAPnet we uh we proposed mainly focused on outputting the packing sequence of the object instead of mm. packing position. So the packing mm. position of each selected object is dependent uh, uh decided by the packing strategy. And here we show like the, here I put a reference here. So this this simple strategy called uh, deepest button left with field strategy is uh, proposed in 2004. And actually, this is one of the simplest packing strategy uh, proposed in previous method. And we also tried several different, more sophisticated packing strategies. And uh, eventually, we, we found that this simple packing strategy work best with our TAPnet, which only output the packing uh, sequence. So this is also uh, uh, a little bit of surprise for us. And we try to analyze why this is the case. And uh, uh, we, we think that maybe because this simple packing strategy is more predictable, so it is easier for TAPnet to, to anticipate uh, where the next object will be placed. So it can output the best of a uh, uh, box for packing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, may I have? Uh, may I ask another question? Yeah. Sure. Uh, hi, Rizal. Um, I uh, in your shape completion uh, work, uh, I it's it's a very nice approach that you can see you consider uh, pairwise relationships between two objects. Uh. I'm wondering, uh, uh, can you tr uh, can you try to extend your approach to a large scale scene that is composed of um, very uh, many many number of uh, cluttered objects? Uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. Th this is uh, a, a, a office, uh, an office scene. Have you tried to maybe a large? Maybe lounge room, have you tried that? Or do you have any yeah. technical challenges to, to do that scale thing? Yeah, this is also a very good question. And the problem we have considered. And uh, so here, the, 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 pro, the reason why only uh, uh, consider pairwise uh, relationship is we think that when give thing with 
uh, like more objects, we can always, uh, if we have the semantic segmentation of those objects, we can always divide it the same into like into pairs. Then we can complete the thing uh, pair by pair. Uh, in this way, we can we can divide the problem like into small problems to solve. I think it would be very challenge uh, to like uh, complete this whole thing all together because then if you want more geometric details, you will need uh, uh, really high resolution coins. And uh, usually I think the network cannot uh, take or uh, output such kind of uh, results. So I think this kind of divide and conquer strategy will work for larger uh, things. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh... If we don't have more questions, uh, so we, we also have some uh, open questions uh, and I wanted to get some uh, comments from uh, Ruizhen, Qixing, and uh, Tianjia. Okay, so uh, the first question is that uh, 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 in, in the uh, recent talk, we uh, noticed that, uh, uh, so the first part is uh, supervised learning and the second part is uh, reinforced learning. So so is our general question that uh, for geometry processing uh, problems, uh, uh, which types are suitable for supervised learning and which is suitable for reinforced learning? And is there a general strategy to combine them together to further uh, improve the result? Maybe Zuizen go first. Oh, okay. So uh, as I shared in today's talk, I think the key difference between those two kind of problem is that uh, like for shape completion, uh, we can easily generate a pair of uh, input and output, output data to supervise the training. And uh, for those shape manipulation tasks, I think the key problem uh, uh, is that uh, for some of the uh, problems like the transpose packing problem, it's hard to really generate or count uh, uh, constructed a set of uh, training data to supervise the learning. And besides, uh, as I show, like for each input data, uh, for those kind of problems, there are always multiple solutions. There always exist multiple optimal solution. If you use supervised learning, you need to decide which optimal solution you want to use. And uh, I think it's a hard decision to make. So instead of choosing one of them to supervise the learning, what I, uh, what I did is to use reinforcement learning to uh, learn a policy to, uh, to explore the uh, uh, space to find one optimal solution. So I think this, uh, this kind of uh, difference makes uh, uh, makes uh, uh, problems like ship manipulation uh, more suitable to apply reinforcement learning. And uh, actually, for the upright uh, estimation work, I think uh, I, as I show, it can be solved using uh, supervised learning and. Uh, and uh, can also be uh, uh, solved using, using reinforcement learning. And there's a result obtained by reinforcement learning is better than that of the uh, supervised learning. And I think, uh, I think so it is promising to combine those two techniques together or even explore the possibility of using reinforcement learning to uh, some previous tasks that always solved using supervised learning to see if we can get to some uh, better results. Okay. So, TC? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, may maybe I uh, add some, like, uh, some uh, common thoughts or something to what Grayson just mentioned. Like, so I think uh, we started with supervised learning 
uh, or maybe I should say that there, there are two type, different types of tags, right? So those are the, some of the tags are very suitable for uh, for supervised learning. Okay, some of the tags are like in particular in robotic settings, right? The, the, like in particular manipulation, uh, embodied AI, right? So those tasks uh, involving like, for example, like the, the objects interacting with other objects, the humans interacting with other objects. And right, so those, I think the, uh, for those, I think the robot, uh, reinforcement learning is the right uh, machine learning framework, okay? Uh, but I do want to mention that I think uh, we do not do supervised learning, in particular in research, right? So I think the trend here is to do unsupervised learning, right? For example, using some self-supervised learning, right? So uh, I think those type tasks are becoming more and more popular. Um, I think in 3D, um, so the uh, reasons uh, uh, showed a uh, point cloud, right? Uh, and also, there are many other representations. I think the, in particular, the consistency across the representations. So the, the, there are great opportunities to uh, uh, develop self-supervised learning, unsupervised learning techniques. Okay. Uh, uh, to I, I think the goal is to reduce the, the amount of labor data. Okay. Uh, so that that is uh, that is the goal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, it, it depends on the problem itself. Uh, for example, for the shape completion tasks, I think maybe supervised learning is more suitable. But uh, for the, for example, for the interior design or layout design tasks, uh, maybe uh, reinforced learning is more natural because these tasks can be considered as a sequential decision making process right uh, so uh, so I, I in my in my opinion if if this for example if these tasks uh, uh, on, on, uh, if these tasks uh, we don't have enough uh, ground truth training data and we can uh, formulate them as a sequential decision making process uh, it is natural for us uh, to design uh, uh, to, to design a kind of maybe a, uh, some policy learning process to use the reinforced learning method uh, to, 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 to learn them. Uh, so uh, so so actually so, uh, I, I'm not I don't do much in, in reinforced learning. Uh, in my research I mainly use the uh, 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 supervised learning and uh, maybe uh, some some uh, uh, unsupervised learning. I, I, I don't use much uh, reinforced learning, but I think if uh, the problem itself can be uh, formulated as a sequential process, I think reinforced learning is 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 natural to 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 try. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the second question is that uh, because the second part is also uh, is about uh, uh, com uh, it's uh, like uh, uh, apply this uh, uh, geometry or, or, or computer graphics uh, method to solve this robotic uh, application uh, problems. So a general question is that uh, about how to uh, integrate between computer graphics and uh, robotic problems. For example, uh, how to utilize this uh, techniques from uh, uh, computer graphics to Im improve the controllability of uh, of the how to improve the controllability of uh, the robotic. Uh, this this is because uh, as uh, shown in the uh, talk of uh, this talk, so you, you we utilize this uh, um, uh, this shape mani manipulation to solve this uh, robotic problems. So on the other hand, uh, uh, we also know that there are uh, many works to. To uh to use uh, robotic to capture and uh, reconstruct re the environment, and uh, in uh, Professor uh, Hui Huang's uh, uh, group, so there are a, a lot of work to use this uh, uh, robotic to do uh, uh, send re reconstruction, right? So except this uh, capture and reconstruction, uh, can we utilize the uh, robotic to help to solve more computer graphics problems? So this is a, uh, we actually we have two questions. So one is uh, how to how apply computer graphics to robotic and uh, 
Another uh, uh, question is uh, how to uh, uh, apply this robotic to help to solve compare graphics problem. Okay. Maybe also uh, uh, reason go first. Okay. So uh, like for the first question is like how to use uh, computer graphics tech, uh, techniques to help with uh, robotic tasks. Uh, I didn't know robotic uh, research much, but as uh, as much as I know, I think they like to use observations obtained using our RGB RGB images or depth image, and they actually didn't use much geometric representations. So I'm, uh, but we study those all kinds of geometric representation a lot. So I'm not, not sure whether uh, different kind of geometrical representation, uh, maybe some more informat uh, informative ones can provide better op observation for the robot, uh, robo uh, robot uh, to learn those uh, policy better. And for the second question about uh, how to use robot to help with uh, computer graphics tasks, uh, so uh, I have another uh, uh, thread of works, which I uh, uh, kind of predict the uh, mobility of the objects and how to interact with the object. But, but all those kind of uh, uh, problems depend on the training data. If we never seen such category, we may get uh, incorrect prediction. So. In here, I think maybe we can use robot to like to interact the uh, with the thing as we predicted, and then we can get some feedback. So if the prediction is incorrect, then the object will never move. So when we get such kind of feedback, maybe we can use that to improve or correct the predictions we get to somehow to uh, like, we always say like a human in the loop, then, then here maybe it's a robot in the loop to actually get, make use of those uh, physical feedback to, uh, to improve the prediction uh, we want to get and to really interact to the thing uh, we never think. Okay, thank you. Uh, Qixin and Tianjia, do you have some comments? Uh, Qixin, do you have any comments? Uh, oh, maybe. Okay, so uh, okay. I can share, uh, share some thoughts from this kind of big picture perspective. Okay, so so I have a personal story, for example, like uh, in like, so uh, in, in the early 2000s, I worked on registration, like, uh, like registration of point cloud. And uh, I saw this, uh, this, this field is baked, right? So then in EQUA, right, the, one of the leading robotics conference 2010, I went there, right? There's a whole session still on this point cloud registration optimization. So the first thing I would say is that I think we need to create channels to so that the, those two community uh, can talk. Okay, so I think uh, you know, for robot for people in robotics, they can certainly benefit from knowing, uh, for example, what we have done right in graphics in geometry processing. That will help the a lot. Uh, I think uh, in many cases they are solving the problems that that people in geometry processing have solved. Okay, uh, but of course, uh, why, why they're interested in this is that for example, in geometry processing, what we work on some data sets, right? So on some benchmark data set do the evaluations. But in robotics, uh, we have to integrate those tasks with some, like right, into, the, into the robotic environment, right? That there are some challenges over, uh, over there. Uh, so what I want to say here is that maybe, maybe on the other hand, graphic people should like it, uh, extend a little bit more, right? So to to work on problems uh, uh, 
fall into the robotics uh, scope, right? For them, this is stand problem, uh, this is a large scale, right? John reconstruction, right? The way and uh, his group, um, Kevin, right? They gave a talk on this kind of uh, integrating robotics and also Li Gang gave a talk here. Um, integrating, uh, right? So not just reconstruction from scans, but integrating uh, the robots, right? Into the reconstruction loop, right? So I think, um, we need to have channels, okay, to so that those two communities like uh, talk to each other more often, okay. Um, I think that could be very beneficial. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Tianjia. <clears throat> uh, I I don't know much about the robotics uh, community, uh, but uh, from my personal aspect, I think uh, computer graphics uh certainly can help uh, improve the controllability of the robot. Uh, for example, recently I'm, I'm reading uh, papers of, of differentiable simulation, right? Uh, with the uh, differentiable simulation framework, uh, we, can, uh, we, we, can, we can solve many interesting uh, uh, inverse problems like, like, like control the uh, fluid, uh, control the clothes, and of course, we can use uh, use the differentiable simulation to control the, the the behavior of the robot. For example, if uh, if we we are controlling a uh, underwater robot uh, in the sea, uh, maybe we can, uh, for example, we, we we can train. We can use the differentiable uh, uh, simulation framework and uh, deep learning new uh, deep neural ne network uh, to to train the. Op, 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 uh, to train the robot operations uh, to, for example, to, to, op, to achieve uh, the, the most suitable tra trajectory of the, of, of the robot, uh, considering the uh, velocity field, the density field of the, of the water, uh, right? So uh, I think it's, to be honest, I'm reading uh, these papers uh, recently, and I think it's an uh, exciting uh, research direction uh, to combine the uh, Computer graphics and 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 the robots. I believe uh, it's, it's a very exciting direction. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so do you guys have uh, uh any other open questions? Uh, so we, we can we, you you can get also propose and we can discuss. Oh, okay. So okay, if not, so uh, so. Let's finish the uh, today's talk. Uh, so we thank Reason's uh, wonderful talk and also uh, thank Chi and uh, Tianjia's comments and uh, uh, inspiring uh, discussions. Uh, I think this is the uh, last talk of this semester, right, Peter? So do you have any yeah. Uh, yeah, concluding I comments? I say, <laughs> yeah, I just want to thank everyone uh, for, for the attention this semester we have. Uh, a, a, a variety of talks, right? So personally, I I learned a lot. Okay, so I'm I'm active in this research community. I learned a lot, and I think uh, in particular, I think um, there are a lot of great uh, projects, right? So from around the world, in particular from China. Okay, I think, uh, and we also see trains, right? So I, so we can reason, right? So we post learning robotics, right? So. Manipulation, right? So interaction, object, ob object, human, right? So object, object interaction. Those are uh, emerging techniques. So thanks to everyone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so let's uh, finish the Torres talk here. Thank you all for your attention. And bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.